have to make up our minds now to live in the kingdom. Because there's a level of divine kingdom access that he's bringing to us. We're already seeing it. There are going to be things that God is going to give us access to and God is going to allow us to do that can only be possible in the kingdom of God. It's not possible culturally. It's not possible in any world standard. But as you live and operate in the kingdom, he is going to give you divine manifestation and divine access. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. joy and the strength that you've been waiting for, God says, I'm providing it even now. You've been asking him to prove himself that if this is really real, allow me to feel the very thing that I've been lacking in my life. I've come here, I've tried to align my life to your will, and so when will my joy, when will the happiness, the peace that I'm asking for come? I hear God saying, is here for you now in Jesus name ah, thank you Jesus and I hear God saying don't try to rationalize what he's getting ready to do for you because you're very you're a very analytical person you got to make sense on paper you got to add up but don't 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 try to rationalize what he's getting ready to do don't try to rationalize what he's getting ready to do in your life. He's going to do something very unique, very unorthodox. But it is going to be a direct answer to a prayer you've been praying. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I pray like Moses that, that, that <laughs> Moses says to Joshua, he said, I wish that all of Israel would prophesy. And I'm praying, I wish that all of heavenly vision prophesied. Do you hear me? I'm praying that God wakes you up. <laughs> We're going to see if, he, if this begins to happen next weekend, if you, if you be, be willing. <clears throat> Here's my prayer, Elder Mo. I'm praying that God wakes you up early next Sunday morning and will speak to you about the person that you're going to sit next to in church. So that before... before <laughs> And, and, and I don't despise the spirit of prophecy. I don't. I don't. Uh, but we talked about this in Bible study. Um, when, when the church is too wrapped up in the gift of prophecy, those who have the gift of prophecy gain too much ungodly authority. But when the church has the spirit of prophecy, all the prophecy is not mounted in the pulpit. It's among the people. God can arrest Mother Johnson and she can tell you what the word of the Lord says. And so I believe in God that we will be a church that walks in the spirit of prophecy because that is the testimony of Jesus Christ. When God begins to talk to somebody else about you, you have no choice but to know Jesus is real. <laughs> I'm not talking about Facebook trolling. I'm talking about hearing the voice of the Lord. Somebody regurgitating the very thing that you prayed about on your pillow last night. in this house and it is here John chapter 12 verse 1 six days after the Passover Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead so they gave a dinner for him there this was his not funeral repast but his resurrection repast <laughs> Oh, I thank God. Can I preach already? I declare, God says, you're not about to celebrate death, but you're about to celebrate new life. I, I hear God saying that. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they were supposed to come together to celebrate your death, but they're going to come together to celebrate you still alive after you died. My God. Because <laughs> you got victory over death, too. They thought your marriage was going to die, but you got victory. They thought your education was going to die, but you got victory. They thought your business was going to die, but you got victory. They thought... Let me read this, please. Uh, Mary served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Martha served, excuse me, and, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Three, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. For but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why, five, why? Was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Six, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Seven, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor, you always have with you, but you do not always have me. For a few moments, we want to speak on the subject, steward the opportunities. Steward the opportunities. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're still in the midst of talking about stewardship, and so today I want you uh, to, to hear what the Lord has to say in regards to us stewarding these opportunities. Uh, this familiar passage of Scripture highlights for us the reality that while we may be in the same tribe, we can have very pr different perspectives on the same situations. Now let me just stop here and just take a moment to thank God for my tribe. I'm excited. I'm excited about the fact that he put us in here together. Amen? We up in here. <laughs> we up in here together. Better or worse, we here together. You are my family. Can you help me encourage somebody else? Tell them, you are my family. You are my family. We are family by choice. Hallelujah. We are family by choice. You're not stuck with me. You, you, you were blessed with me. Amen? Amen. We are family by choice. And so I thank God for our tribe. Amen. Those of you who have already signed up uh, for All In, you're going to get your t-shirts real soon. Amen. And those who may sign up outside before you leave, you're going to get your All In shirts. And we're just going to come here tribed up, just straight tribal dancing. This is our tribe. We, this is us. We are in here. We in here. Uh, but I understand that while we may be in here together, we are part of the same tribe there might be times where we see things differently. We have different perspectives on different situations. Now, let me, let me deal with this quickly before we get out of here. Just because we see something different don't mean that we can't be together. Too many relationships suffer and they break simply because there was a difference in perspective or opinion. That's okay. We can have different perspectives. We can see things different, view things from a different vantage point, and still be together. That's all right. And while differences of perspective or opinion does not automatically constitute right or wrong, however, there will come a time in our lives where we will be called upon to make a decision based on our perspectives or opinions. This decision will be an opportunity to do one of two things. Here it is. You will be called to either sow or steal. <laughs> it's about to get tough. We're going to make it through this sermon together. Amen. You will either sow or steal. I, I wonder what you're going to do. Look at your neighbor like, I wonder. <laughs> you look like a sower or a stealer. 
Now, when I say sow or steal, listen to me. I'm not talking about stealing or sowing from God. I'm not talking about the church or anybody else for that matter. Can I go deeper here? I'm talking about yourself. You will either sow into yourself or you will steal from yourself. Let's, let's make sense of it. See, you can either sow into your destiny or steal from it for the sake of fulfilling your present desires. Because this text, Keenan, when I started setting this text, Jerry, when I started setting this text, man, I had never seen this perspective of this text before. Listen, you can either sow into your destiny or steal from your destiny to fulfill a present desire. See, destiny and desire are two different things. Destiny is what God built into your heart before you were born. Desire is what you want right now, depending upon where you are. If you're on the beach, you don't desire a parka. And if you're in the Arctic, you don't desire a bikini. Your desire is based on your position or your situation. And this is why you can't build your life on desire. Help me, Holy Ghost. This is why you can't just get into a relationship with somebody because you desire them. You got you to gotta ask yourself if destiny is wrapped up in them. Karen and I both look very different in 2005. 2003, 2002, we started hollering at each other, 2002, 2003, we started hollering at each other, 2003, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was different, I was different. We drove different, we had different thoughts, we had different ideas, had different things. And we almost, here it is, we almost missed our destiny because we were being, and maybe she, maybe she wasn't, maybe it was just me. But I was being short-sighted with her. My flesh had no problem seeing my desire for her. Come on, she had that Echo Red jumpsuit, you know. Come on, y'all remember Echo Red? Come on, don't act like you don't remember. Come on, Fat Farm. You know, I, I, at least about 18 women in here had Fat Farm on their behind for like three years. Fat farm. It's right here. It's right here. Come on, y'all remember that. <laughs> and I almost missed my destiny because I was wrapped up in my desire. And so when I say sow or steal, I'm not talking about sowing and stealing from anybody else or even God. I'm talking about you can literally sow into your destiny or steal from your destiny to fulfill a present desire. Uh, now, I, I know that's, that's a very bold statement, but as we read our text of focus, we see both Mary and Judas responding to the same opportunity in different ways. Now, we're going to get the hard stuff out the way first by looking at Judas. Look at your text, and when you see the text, uh, the Bible says that Mary does what she does. And it, it, it's immediately after seeing that, the scripture says that Judas, he, he, he looks at what she does, and he understood that, man, that, that's worth a lot of money. Now, notice this. A denarii is basically the amount of money that a Roman soldier would make per day. The amount of money that a Roman soldier would make per day. And so this, this literally is, is 300 paydays. 300 paydays because they would get their wage at the end of every day. This is 300 paydays. And so when she cracks this stuff open on Jesus, she wasn't giving him the cheap stuff. She wasn't just giving him whatever, son. She was giving him the real, she was giving him the business, basically. She was extravagant. 
she, was, she, she, she laid it all out. She withheld nothing. And Judas begins to count that up. He begins to count that up. And notice what the scripture says. Not because he cared about the poor, but because he knew that Mary was a loyal member of Jesus' church. <laughs> and if she sold into Jesus' church, that he was going to meet the offering in the back office. And he could do whatever he wanted to do with that offering. So he was like, girl, you should have sold that into the ministry. Here's, here's what we learn about Judas. Judas seen Jesus as an opportunity to steal. And any time we see the actions of the sovereign as an opportunity to take advantage of somebody else, we have to check our heart position. Anytime we see the movement of the sovereign, the activity of the Holy Ghost moving in a body, moving among a people, moving in a particular circumstance, and we see that vulnerability of people because they are open to the move of God to take advantage of them, we have to check our heart position. Here it is. I've made many mistakes in my life. I've done things wrong. But as I stand before you, I have no desire to steal Heavenly Vision's money. And I'm going to tell you why. One, because I don't want to go to jail. Been there, don't want to go back. I don't care if it was just a knife. Them bros was rough in there. All of us, one taller. Just no, just no petition to nothing, huh? You know, just right here, huh? That's how we do it? Okay. Jesus, I don't want to come back here. So I'm not going to steal the money because I, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> But I'm also not going to steal the money because I don't want to go to hell. Hmm? Listen, the stuff is nice, but it ain't worth my soul. No, it ain't worth my soul. I will shop at Target first. You hear me? I don't care about no Louis Vuitton. This good fellas work just fine. What's this, Massimo? What is this? This is nice. This is nice. This on sale too? Nice or not? Where the clearance rack? 30% off? I will rock that. I will rock that. Where's Old Navy? I will listen. I ain't got time for that. I'm not gonna be one of the pastors that you know get, get caught up without bought a Gucci belt with the church card. No, it's not. Mm -mm. No, no, no. That ain't me. So I don't want to go to jail. Certainly don't want to go to hell. I'm not gonna do that. But here's here's what we see about the life of Judas that we got a challenge in ourselves. Number one, what does he do? He challenges. Her generosity. You got to check your motives when you challenge it, not what folk tell you to give, but when you challenge what other people give. People, people, he didn't give no offering. She did. God didn't say, I need everybody right now. Come on, lift your hands in this room right now. I need you to, I need, there's somebody in the room got 300 denarii that's about to sow into my ministry right now. Jesus didn't do that. Of her own accord, she decided, listen, I got to bless this man. And I'm going to give this to him. She didn't, she didn't say, hey, y'all, can you give me some money so I can buy some ointment for Jesus? No, she does it of her own accord. And Judas, being a hater... He got commentary on, on her generosity. Watch yourself when you got something to say about somebody else's generosity. Why you do that for them? They don't even deserve that. You know they just going to do this with it. Listen, that ain't none of your business. What I do with my generosity, now I know this is tough for some of us. And I believe in wisdom. I believe in, in, in having uh, guidelines on how we give and what we do. But if our heart is pricked by the Holy Spirit to do something, we have to operate according to the will of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And when I operate over the will of the Holy Spirit, I need you to have enough Holy Ghost to know that I'm giving for the purposes of God and not to be seen. And allow my giving, allow my generosity to spur something in you and to break your stinginess. So the first thing he did, he challenged her generosity. 
the second thing we understand is that he desired to help himself rather than others. Notice what the scripture says. It says that he helped himself to the offering. Check your heart. When you put your stuff aside first, before you help somebody else. Now, I'm not talking about the airplane mentality that you got to put your mask on <laughs> before you help somebody else. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about when we have been blessed to be a blessing to somebody else, but before we bless somebody else, we make sure that we bless ourselves. Here's the fallacy about that thinking. When we have this scarcity mentality, God can never trust you with big blessings. I mean, listen, some of y'all got millionaire dreams. But if you have a scarcity mentality, you will never be able to really live in full, even fiscal or financial or tangible abundance. Because if God can't trust you to bless somebody, he can't trust you with being blessed. So there will be, man, I, I, thank you, God. I believe that before tax season, hallelujah, I'm going to declare this in Jesus' name. Y'all in my tribe? Come on, accept this. I'm believing, God, that, that there's going to there's be a group of us, and some of us are already on the other side, and we're, we're experiencing the prosperity of the Lord. But there's a few of us that we still, we still at that get by place. And some of us have, have declared, Lord, I don't want to just get by in 2019. Lord, I want to, you know, I want to live in abundance. I want to be able to, to like, I want to be able to pay all the bills and still go somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because we pay all them bills, it'd be like one dollar. Like, God, tough. I mean, you happy because you paid them, but you're like, dang, I can't go to Raising Cane's or nothing. I can't. Three, three strips? I believe, and I'm going to prophesy this right now. I believe God is going to test your heart. And he's going to bring something of significant value to your hand. And, the, and, and as, if I be a man of God, when you get it in your hands, remember these words. What's the first thing you're going to do with it? Because some of us going to immediately think to that thing we've been wanting. And God will say, okay, all right, <laughs> another broke year, all right, okay, thanks, that's what it's going to be, okay, another, another get by year, all right, hey, hey, maybe, maybe 2020, maybe 2020 is that year. But some of us are going to say, wait a minute, I, I remember that that buck two black dude told me this. And so God, give me clarity on what I need to do first. Who do I need to bless? Where do I need to sow? What do I need to give? Because here's the reality. Since he gave Jesus, he has never required anybody to give everything. He never tells you to give everything. He only requires you to give you. And even in giving you, he gives you ability. He gives you prerogative. He, give, he gives you choices. And so remember that. Remember that. Because I feel God, he's going to push somebody. He's going he's to push it. It's, it's going to be something ex, unexpected. And remember, remember that you have to make a proper decision. You have to maximize that opportunity. But not only does he desire to help himself before others, not only does he challenge generosity. Here's the last thing. He allowed his greed to blind him to the beauty of the moment. He allowed his greed to blind him to the beauty of the moment. Look at this. Because we, we, we see this in the church, and we see this in our families. No, notice, no, notice this. This is, this is a beautiful, get this picture in your head. You got a man who was verifiably dead. Verifiably, like three days, stinketh dead. That's what the, that's what King, you know, the most favorite Bible, the King James Version said, and he stinketh. He was dead, dead. <laughs> and he's risen from the dead. 
and he's sitting eating at the table. That's beautiful. And then Martha cooks this feast, and she's serving. That's beautiful. And then Mary takes out this, like, Tom Ford, <laughs> Creed, Aventus type stuff, you know, and breaks it over Jesus' feet and begins to anoint him and takes, okay, here, here you go, the most expensive bundle you could imagine. Come on, that three, four, five hundred dollar bundle. 28 inch, you know. Imagine that, right? However much you pay for that and that, all that time it took to sew it in, like, like, you know, you see the part and everything. She did good job. And then just lay on the floor and take that. You know, you know how y'all do. I love, I love, you know when a woman get their hair done, she be like, you know, just all that gets on the floor and wipes Jesus' feet. Come on, Dee like said, that's love. Yes, love. I paid eight hundred dollars for this. That's love. Yes, this is beautiful stuff going on sacrifice and and not if that weren't enough if that weren't enough there was this beautiful fragrance this beautiful aroma that's filling the room you don't smell feet you don't smell the dinner you don't smell if anybody just you know Passed the shower, just get hurried up to get here because they was late from work. You know, you don't smell the day. <laughs> you know, you ever smell day on somebody? Like, man, you had a, you had a, you had a day, didn't you? <laughs> Woo, I can smell it. <laughs> That's what a day. <laughs> so this aroma is filling this room, and it's beautiful. You got people resurrected, people serving, people sacrificing. The, the, the aroma is beautiful. And he sit here, probably had his hands folded. Probably looking stank. Mary, I can't even believe you. You so, ooh, ooh. Look at you. you do you know what we could have did with this? And you going you gonna to put all this on Jesus' feet? Ask yourself, how many times have I been so wrapped up in me that I missed the beauty of certain moments because I was in me? I missed the beauty of my, of my child doing something amazing because I was wrapped up in me. I miss the beauty of my wife saying something amazing, of my, of my husband doing something amazing. I miss the beauty of the worship. I miss the beauty of the moment because I was wrapped up in my own stuff. We got to challenge that, family. Because when we're operating in these realities, we're stealing from ourselves. Here's the thing. You're not stealing from your neighbor. Because God, if you don't want to bless him, God can raise up a donkey. You hear what I'm saying? He can, he can mess around and have a fish just spit coins out of his mouth. God can bless you. High, and let me, hold on. Let me just pause parenthetically and say this. Let me give you freedom from the folk in your life that make you think you ain't going to eat unless they there. Let me just free you for a second. Because there may be some people that have mounted themselves in your life to make you think that if, if, if they're not there, you can't get by. You better remind them that I serve a real God who is not sheltered by flesh. Don't allow yourself to be a thief. Fight the, fight the thief mentality. Fight it. Fight it. Because it, it, it rises in all of us. But you got to fight that because I don't want to steal from my destiny. But when we pan the camera around the room, we see Mary. And Mary seen Jesus 
as an opportunity to sow. Now, here's the first thing we got to understand. Her generosity was preceded by her gratefulness. Her generosity was preceded by her gratefulness. You read the whole Bible, don't you? Go back to John chapter 11. This is the same Mary in John chapter 11 who was crying at the same feet. <laughs> just a chapter ago, just a couple of days ago, she was crying at the feet of Jesus because her brother was dead. But imagine how it is a couple of weeks later, a few days rather later, the same brother that I had to bury, I'm now sharing bread with. Ooh, I wish I had some grateful people in the room. See, some, some of us, we ain't got to be begged to give or to be generous because we began to think about how good God has been to us. We began to think about the ways he made, the doors he opened. Come on. We remember when we were poor and we were broke and we were sleeping on somebody else's couch. We remember when we didn't have anything. And so when God gives us something, we like freely I have, freely I give. So sometimes it's not that they stingy, they just don't have enough to be grateful for. So even before she became a generous, extravagant giver, she had some gratitude in her heart. She had a brother who was dead, and that's alive now, so her generosity preceded her, it was preceded by her gratefulness. So if you want to be, you want to be a generous person, you look around in your life and see what you have to be grateful for. Here it is. She gave, watch this, she gave tangibly because God gave her something that she couldn't buy. You see, some folks sow, some folks sow like crazy because they get stuff from God they can't buy at the store. See, I, you can have all this money because what I need from you, I can't even swipe to get it. I need some joy. I need some peace. I need you to resurrect my marriage. I need you to resurrect my mind. I need you to take these suicidal thoughts. I need you to take this depression off me. I need you to... My God, my God. See, I... Do, is there anybody grateful? Is there anybody in here that can just take a, just a glance back? I, you ain't even got to take a whole look. Just glance back at where you used to be. Glance back at how it used to be. Glance back to when you were alone. Glance back to when you cried yourself to sleep. Glance back to when you had to... Uh, come on, y'all, y'all. It, it, it ain't been that long ago for me. I remember when me and all my kids were sleeping in one room with my wife. I remember, I remember when I had to do that. So when I walk up the stairs to my room, I can't do nothing but say, God, God, what you want me to give this week? What can I, what can I render to the Lord for all his benefits? I had to check somebody recently. They're like, oh, you, 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 you just a giver because you're getting paid by the church. I said, Negro, please. I was given before the church paid me. And the, what I got now, the church can't even afford. But the Lord. I wish I had some grateful people in here that say, I know what God has done for me. Ain't no man name on this. Ain't no people name on this. This got God name on it. God did this. God opened this door. God made a way. Oh, I wish somebody would just put a praise on it right there. God, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for everything you've done for me. Through dangers seen and unseen, when I could not see my way, when I was hungry, when I was begging, when I was borrowing, when I was stealing. I'm going to let you go up. I feel this in my soul. Ah, and I hear the Lord saying, I'm about to give somebody something to be grateful for. 
because it ain't enough people saying amen. Somebody about to get a check in the mail. Somebody about to get some real keys. Somebody about to get a yes. Somebody about to get an approval. Somebody about to get a... And when you get it, just remember that I told you so. Her generosity was preceded by gratefulness. You ain't got to beg nobody to give anything. <laughs> if God been good to them, they gonna prove it. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Y'all sit down. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Watch it, Keon. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, boy. She served. Here it is. She served while she sold. That's the next thing I need you to hear. She served while she sowed. I don't know, I don't know what happened to the Western church that made us think that we can either sow or serve. Yeah, that ain't, that ain't how the Bible read. It ain't like you can either serve or give. No, you serve and give. And here it is. When you study Barna research, Barner Research says that most churches, generally, whatever their whatever their uh, uh, their their number is, their attendance or the the the, the size of the membership, generally, it's ten percent of that number that serve consistently, and it's also ten percent of that number that give consistently. And in most times, it's the same people. You hear what I just said? It's the same, the same people that give are the same people that serve. And the same people that serve are the same people that give. But I believe in God that he's about to turn the tide in this house. So we all give and we all serve. We may not serve at the same time. We may not give at the same rate, but we all up in here. So when we start building buildings and we start feeding people and we start taking people off the street, can't nobody say, look what they did. You're going to be up here like, look what we Ain't no them. It's us. <laughs> we all in. You hear what I'm saying? I'm up in here too. I tied. <laughs> yeah, you see the, our building? <laughs> Y'all going to be up at the, at the ground breaking like, yay, with a gold shovel. Like, and I ain't mad at you. <laughs> she served while she gave. So she didn't just say, here's some ointment, Jesus. God bless you. No, she sold and said, here, let me administer my seed. <sighs> Can I help somebody? Some of us are not getting, <clears throat> some of us are not getting the harvest we desire because we left our seed unattended. Somebody go get it on Tuesday. Watch. Some of us are right now mad because we didn't get the harvest that we asked for because we just sowed it and left it. This is not a set it and forget it type culture. The Bible says that God, when he speaks a word, he watches over the word to perform it. You can't just sow and run it. You have, you have to manicure your seed. Talk to me for a minute. Heavenly, and, and just, uh, this ain't got to be no congregation meeting, but listen, listen. Heavenly Vision is not a church that you just give and you don't have no say in what happens. No. Because those who are in leadership know that, watch this, when, 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 when plans are presented, when people say, okay, can we do this? We, we, watch this, we fund it. The majority of stuff that's happened is not because James wanted to happen, not because Karen wanted to happen, but because somebody, they, they instituted it. Kenny said, I need to go to school. We made sure he went to school. See, oh, okay, all right, I'm not, I'm not trying to put nobody, listen, listen, I, I, ain't, I ain't going no further, but I need you to understand something, that you have the grace to watch over your seed. 
to work the toil, I mean, to work the soil that your seed is in. Now, here it is. Shame on you if you sow a seed and don't work the soil that it's in. Then you subject to whatever harvest you get. So don't be mad at God. When your harvest coming, you're like, oh, what is this? That's your raggedy seed that you didn't. <laughs> Dirt and cigarette butts and all kind of stuff just blowing over it. and It's all dry. Only, only, only water your seed get is when somebody in proximity to your seed watering their seed. Elder, I told you, man, it was going to be tough. I told you, man, I told you. Listen, here's the reality, because we all in this together. We have to watch over what we sow. So she sowed and served. Here it is. I'm not telling you got to do everything I do. But I am saying that there's some stuff that I'm doing that you ought to be doing. Because I'm about my seed. Are you about yours? Come on, ask somebody. I'm about my seed. So I, I ain't out here just sowing. I'm like, hey, what, 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 Tuesday, we'll be back Tuesday, 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 spiritual gifts, Saturday, Saturday. That's when we, we, we hear Saturday. I, I got to leave at 2, but I'm, listen, I'm going to be there at 12. I'm, yeah, we're going to, listen, let's get it in. Because I'm believing God. Here it is. I don't want to leave anything on the table that God had for me to take. Because, see, you got some folk that's around you that's like, while thou art showering blessings. You got some people around you that's like the woman with the issue of blood. I know you're going to Jairus' house, but uh, uh, since you're here, not only was her generosity preceded by gratefulness, not only did she serve while she sold, here's the last thing. She sold at the right time. Preachers, y'all gotta catch this because I ain't never noticed this before. She had this ointment, expensive ointment made of nard. This was, here it is, this was an ointment that was developed by the Egyptians to cover a body with, here it is, to preserve the body. Because when you put the nard on the body, watch this, it would close up the pores to lock in the blood. So even though the body would decompose, it would decompose within itself and the decom decomposition process wouldn't ooze out because the nard, once it dried, it hardened. It would harden and it wouldn't let anything come out. It's the same thing that they would use to put at the bottom of their boats. So the boats could float on the Nile. And they said it'll work the same way on a body. But wait a minute. She had the opportunity to use this a couple of weeks ago. She had the opportunity to use this a couple of days ago because her brother died. Her brother died days ago. And if she loved Jesus, most certainly she loved her brother. But the Bible says they buried him in the tomb. And she decided not to use the nard. She left it in the cabinet. Now, this might be conjuncture. And this, this may be borderline eisegesis, and I'm not going to go no deeper than this, my, my school of ministry students. But I, I want to put an illusion on the text, or at least I want to put a quandary to the text. Why? If she had this ointment that could preserve her brother's body, why would she not use it on him?
And might I submit to you that while it may be a good idea, it's not necessarily a God idea. I'm about to free you from giving all your savings to something that God didn't tell you to. Because some of y'all, you got the ability to help them. But it may not be the time for you to use it. I ain't with Mary. I, don't, I can't say Elder Mo, but all we do know is, is that she had it. And she had an opportunity to use it. And here's my prayer for every one of you before I dismiss this service. My prayer for every one of you is that while God may bless you with resource, he will also bless you with wisdom to know when the opportunity is right. You ever seen that? Some argue that she knew that Jesus was the resurrection. So she didn't waste her nard because she knew if she called Jesus, he was going to fix the situation anyway. That's a good observation. Some people say that she was keen to all the scripture that Jesus, or, or all the, the teaching that Jesus gave. And she already purposed in her heart when she heard him say he was going to die, she had already sanctified that offering for him. These are just observations. And so the two things I want to share with you is this. One, if we go with the first observation, here it is. Don't waste your, don't waste your time doing something that God can do. Second observation is this. There are some things that are too important to use before it's time. I don't care who asks. I don't care who hungry. Listen, somebody around here got some food. I don't care who, listen, listen, you can sleep at my house, but I'm not going to, you know, bankroll your house. You will have to obey God as it relates. See, some things have to be sanctified. I'm moving. If you don't have anything in your life that's sanctified, that's set apart, everything is up for grabs. If you don't have anything in your life that says you can't touch that, can't touch this. If you don't have anything in your life that is sanctified, the devil can put his hands on everything. Because whatever you let man touch, the devil can touch it too. But if you keep it out of man's hands, you also keep it out of the enemy's hands. Here it is. I'm done. Mark chapter 14 verse 9 says, And, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And what we're doing right now is a testimony to this. Now, I want to encourage every one of you to steward your opportunities to sow. You're going to have opportunities in the church and outside of the church to make significant seeds. I'm going to challenge you to remember the words of this message today. Because ultimately, here it is, ultimately is not just meeting a physical need or a financial need. Ultimately, you are fulfilling the gospel. When you sow into heavenly vision, ultimately you are fulfilling the gospel. <clears throat> here it is, and I'm letting you go. I'm closing my laptop. She anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, I just told you why the, why the Egyptians used it. Notice this. When you study the decomposition process of the body, what happens is all of the blood flows to the lower extremities. And the reason why she anointed Jesus' feet, because she knew he was going to die, 
but maybe she wanted to make sure that the blood stayed in because he was going to use it again. And I don't know what God is calling you to sow. But whatever God calls you to do, whenever he, he, he anoints you to do, whether you sign up for all in, and I believe everybody will, and, and, and we begin to sow in the church, and not just in the church, outside of the church, when he pricks your heart to move on behalf of somebody else, I pray that you're able to steward the opportunities. Listen, she helped make sure. Now listen, we, we, we can't say this all together, but I wonder. I wonder if she made the resurrection process easier because she did her part. Now, God is never going to make you do everything. But I hear God in this room. I hear God in the spirit saying, I need you to do your part. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your scripture. That makes sense to us. And we pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would lead us in the direction whereby we will. Hallelujah. We will steward our opportunities. God, we do not want to steal from ourselves. We want to sow into our destiny. So, Father, I pray right now that you would make it clear to us what we should do and how we should do it. Father, I pray right now that you would awaken in us a spirit of servitude. Awaken in us, Father God, a spirit of gratefulness. Awaken in us a spirit of generosity. So that we will see the divine harvest that you have for us. And so we pray that you would allow these words to take root in us. That it would manifest, and it is so. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you get a word from the Lord today? Amen.